Matthew Gilsbach. Hello, and I am Carrie Ogrizovich. I am the ASL program coordinator, and I also teach ASL here at UVM. So we want to welcome you to our kickoff event for Deaf History Month, uh, featuring Dr. Carol Patton. I work in the Office of Campus Programs, and we provide support and we plan and um, host events around campus. Um, Deaf History Month is one of these events. Carrie and I were in discussion um, concerning the ASL program, and we've decided that we are going to sponsor this annually. Um, we are funders of this and just give all different kinds of supports. Deaf History Month begins on March 13th and it runs um, through the period of April 15th. And you may find that odd, but um, you may be familiar with the history um, of a deaf protest at Gallaudet University, um, the protest Deaf President Now. And on uh, March 13th, that movement actually ended and I, King Jordan, was selected um, as the president, the first deaf president of the university. And Gallaudet is the um, only deaf university here in the United States. And it was established in the 1800s. Our next event will be happening on this coming Friday. Um, it will be um, linked to this. We'll have an ASL lunch and roundtable discussion. We'll be talking about um, international sign languages, and uh, we'll try to incorporate a lot of what we uh, learned from Dr. Patton's lecture this evening. Uh, before I turn it over to Carrie, um, we will have um, tickets available in the back of the room for Sign Mark, um, who will be coming to the Burlington area. Um, he will be uh, performing or providing a show at Higher Ground. It's $15 if you want to buy your ticket this evening. Um, you can also um, save some money by doing it that way. Um, tickets will be available at the door for a higher cost, but tickets are available at the table in the lobby, so go ahead and grab those now. And the show is on April 14th. Oh, I also forgot too, um, after uh, the presentation this evening, we'll have a light re reception in the Sugar Maple Ballroom, right through the doors. All right. Thank you, Matthew. So, I want to talk a little bit about why we chose Dr. Jennifer Dickinson um, to introduce our keynote speaker. She's very familiar with Dr. Patton's work. Works, and um, she is also, well, actually, let me go back to when I first met her. I met her in 2007 when the College of Arts and Sciences were discussing um, the proposal to accept American Sign Language as a foreign language. She is a professor in the Anthropology Department, and I always thank her for ad her advocacy and support in making, um, in helping us be a success in American Sign Language being recognized as a foreign language here. She is exceptional at several different languages. She's fluent, and she's about to add one more language to her repertoire. This summer, she has decided to take American Sign Language, so yay for her. So I'm happy to introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Jennifer Dickinson. Jennifer? I would like to, be, to begin by thanking Carrie Grzevich and the ASL program, not only for giving all of us the opportunity to become better acquainted with the fascinating <laughs> research on emerging sign languages, which Dr. Patton will present tonight, but also for their tireless efforts over the years to promote awareness deaf culture, language, and history within UVM and the broader community. I have the great honor tonight of introducing our keynote speaker, Dr. Carol Patton. She is a professor in, at the University of California, San Diego, in the Department of Communication, where she is also Associate Dean for the Division of Social Sciences. Dr. Patton, <coughs> has cited her own experiences as a deaf child, educated largely among hearing peers in public school and higher education settings, and striving to communicate across linguistic and cultural divides as an important influence in her linguistic work 
on sign languages and signing communities. Working with pioneers in the field of linguistics of sign languages at Georgetown and then at UCSD, Patton's scholarly work has been highly influential from her award-winning 1983 dissertation entitled <coughs> Interaction of Morphology and Syntax in American Sign Language to her recent work on ASL and deaf culture and in the exciting and developing field of the linguistics of emerging sign languages. I would like to focus my remarks today on Dr. Patton's leadership in these two distinct areas, the structure of sign languages on one hand, and the historical and cultural context in which sign languages emerge and develop on the other. Indeed, it is her recognition of the importance of the intersection between these two areas of study that has made her work so widely read and influential across different fields. Of interest to students of sign languages and deaf cultures, as well as scholars in fields like communication, linguistics, anthropology, psychology, and history. Among her many publications are works on the formal linguistic properties of sign languages, on language and literacy development in, lit in deaf children, and on the shared culture of ASL speakers. The thread that runs through these diverse sets of publications is a holistic approach to language, not as an abstraction, but as a system shared and used by speakers in daily life. <clears throat> Patton has argued that natural sign languages, like natural spoken languages, are a human adaptation of available resources, like the body and the vocal apparatus, to meet the communication and symbolic needs of communities of speakers. Like all human languages, sign languages are dynamic. They emerge grow and disappear because they are used or fall out of use within communities. In the case of natural sign languages, these communities of speakers are united by their deafness and by the modality of signed communication. It is signed communication, a structured and systematic use of the body for linguistic purposes that characterizes the natural languages that emerge from these communities but it is the culture and practices within communities that determine how these languages are transmitted to the next generation. Seen in this light, it is clear that to study and understand the form of natural sign language, you must study and understand the communities from which these languages emerge. As a linguistic anthropologist, I am especially appreciative of Dr. Patton's emphasis on community, as well as her recognition of variation across sign languages and the communities that use them. Reviewing the range of her work, I am struck again and again by the emphasis she places on languages in use, whether analyzing the natural iconicity of the signer's body as an element of emerging grammatical constructions, or comparing the context for language acquisition in distinct sign language communities. Her approach continually reminds readers that sign languages exist because of their speakers and for their speakers. These languages are significant not only for their linguistic features, but also because they are the primary means by which their speakers communicate with each other and do all those social, cultural, linguistic things that human beings do. Joke, share, argue, create, narrate, learn, understand, and create a history in their communities. Patton's linguistic work, including recent publications on iconicity and complex morphology in sign languages, while also focused on language users, challenges readers to recognize and reevaluate a larger bias towards spoken language in the study of linguistic structure. 
Too often, spoken languages are presented as a yardstick for all human languages, with the assumption that spoken language is the default from which sign languages deviate in various but interesting ways. Sign languages are unique, special. They are, of course, truly human languages on a par with all other human languages, but they are also more. They outline more possibilities for the human capacity to make language. They stretch the limits of our expectations for human adap adaptability, both in the present and in the evolutionary past, at the dawn of the development of human language. Sign languages reveal the limitations inherent in the two-dimensional yardstick of spoken language by demonstrating that linearity is a limiting feature not of human language, but of spoken languages. And that when given the opportunity to thrive in the three-dimensional space of signs, human language, or maybe it's better to say humans using language, will make the most of those three dimensions through coordination of spatial and linguistic cognitive capacities. This same challenge to rethink the cultural and linguistic <coughs> relationships that arise across hearing and deaf communities is present in an introduction to a volume on sign languages and bilingualism, in which Patton writes, quote, sign language, okay. quote, sign languages are always minority languages in any nation, and the burden is always in one direction, to accommodate spoken language, unquote. Her research, like that of many who do work with speakers of minority and emerging languages, is both rigorously scientific and deeply political. I say political because it is built on a philosophical foundation that demands recognition and equality for those minority and emerging languages. This same philosophical foundation assumes the legitimacy of all human languages. And the right of all human beings to be immersed in and acquire a language from infancy. The right of all humans to use, adapt, and express themselves in a native language and the rights of communities of speakers to converse with one another in the language of their choice, in modalities suited to their needs. <clears throat> this political element explains why the study of the structure of sign languages is so intimately tied to the historical and cultural questions surrounding communities of signers because the histories of signed languages are intimately tied to the histories of the communities that use them. In her research on an emerging sign language, which she will be discussing today, Dr. Patton has again demonstrated why communities of users must be at the center of how we study the formal properties of language. To better understand how languages take shape over time, we must focus on linguistic elements and how they are used in context by groups of speakers driven by a human need to socialize and communicate. Dr. Patton's research should remind us that when we place people and communities, not like abstract linguistic forms, at the center of the study of language, we see that a language cannot exist without the people who use it, and that all languages and all speakers can contribute volumes to our understanding of humanity, not only in historical context, but in the present and the future. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Carol Pett. <coughs> It's very difficult to see, but I'm going to do the best I can here, given the bright lights. Uh, can I be seen by folks? I hope so. 
I put together a talk this evening. Uh, things that I enjoy talking about. Things that are of interest to me. When I talked with Matthew about a topic for this evening, I decided, uh, we decided together actually, that it would be good to talk about emerging, he was interested in science from around the world. And I really preferred to talk about one specific part of the world where I've been working for, well I was going to say 20 years, but actually 30 years I've been working on ASL. But I've been working in this particular part of the world for 10 years. So my talk tonight, I hope, is uh, a good representation of the work that I've done. I have some photos that I want to share with you to give this some context. And you might say to yourself, where is this place? This is an area in southern Israel. It's a village with about 3,000 inhabitants. And depending on who's counting who you talk to, there were between 125 and 150 deaf people in the village. And you may be uh, curious about why so many deaf people are in this one area, and I will get into that later in the talk. When I heard about this, when I initially uh, heard about this village, I was going uh, to study the sign language there and think about ways in which it might be compared to or used to study ASL. I was in Israel. Somebody mentioned the village to me. It's a Bedouin community and it was um, not too long a drive from where I was. And you probably have seen uh, movies of people riding camels with uh, capes and hoods. It's not quite the same as it was in days gone by, but it is a community of individuals with that heritage. And there are Bedouins all over the Middle East. And they are often referred to as the original Arabs. King, uh, king Jordan, the King of Jordan, was a uh, Bedouin. So when I heard about this 10 years ago, I really didn't have any information about the Middle East myself. I wasn't well versed in Bedouins, and I knew just very, I had just arrived in Israel, so I didn't really even know very much about Israel. I was curious and open and decided I would take the trip. I was invited into a home that looks very much like the photo here, and was offered coffee, a very small little cup of strong coffee, and I looked around and noticed that many of the people were signing. And the only other place I had that same feeling was Gallaudet. I mean, they were everybody was signing. I didn't know who was hearing and who and who was deaf. It was impossible to tell. So I knew right away this would be an interesting place to work. And my colleagues and I decided to uh, begin a project there. And I will tell you more about this in the course of the presentation. We wrote a, pres a proposal for the study and talked about the fact that we were going to investigate this relatively new sign language, which evolved about 75 years ago. And of interest to us was to investigate how this language emerged, how it had developed over time. So this is a photograph that's very typical of the Bedouin homes. People live with very large families. This is the front of a home. The Bedouin people have a very strong connection to the land. They were in fact nomadic in the past, but they are much more rooted and stationary now. They do have electricity in today's world, but they didn't. Uh, they had water that was actually just uh, connected a few years ago. I actually have examples of video. I'm not going to explain to you what the language looks like, but I have actual film uh, clips of people signing, and I want to ask you, please, I don't want anyone to take any photographs of the individuals or the video clips. The people I worked with certainly gave permission for the research, but we don't 
have permission, nor do I want anyone to take any of these images and put them on the web or and share them any place outside of this talk. And I hope that's agreed to and understood here. You know, there's no better way for you to see what I'm talking about than to actually give you examples of this. And there is an official uh, person filming here tonight, but that's uh, something that's been granted permission by me. <coughs> There are about an estimated 6,000 spoken languages in the world. But when we come to the question of how many sign languages there are, I'm wondering if anyone in the audience can posit a guess. Anyone? 500, someone says. Hmm. Well, the answer to that question is we really don't know. There is a website called ethnologue.com, and if you Check that out online. You will see the kinds of um, statistics that they have about how many languages, in spoken languages and signed languages, and their estimate is 130. And I think that's a low number because they are looking for um, appropriate documentation from people who give them submissions. So I think the number is much higher than that. Need. But there is one teacher who wants to teach the children through sign language. There are sign languages on every continent. And I have some video clips of examples. Here's a sign language from China. There's more and more research being done worldwide on sign languages. Uh, until this time, there was predominantly research done on ASL in Europe and in Japan. <coughs> and what we've seen with the research that's been done is that there are two general types of sign languages. And this research, uh, over the past 30 years, has shown us that there is something called village sign language and deaf community sign languages. I've been working for the past 30 years on deaf community sign languages. And these are languages that are, where there are many different, there are deaf users of the language who have become deaf at different times in their lives. They may have deaf family members, they may not, but they find themselves uh, perhaps living near a school for uh, the deaf, like here in Brattleboro or in Riverside or Hartford. So those areas where deaf people congregated, uh, communities of users gathered together. But the second kind of sign languages that we're seeing are what's referred to as village sign languages. And that's what I'm gonna focus on this evening. These are areas where there is strong genetic deafness, where people are born in a rather closed community, where they live together closely. And that community of users is usually isolated from other users of sign language or from schools for the deaf, and that may be by geographic or for other reasons. And we see this um, in the world with all kinds of cultures where people stay within their own group and they have strong identity and they don't in fact do a lot of mixing with people from outside of their culture and their group. And it could be an ethnic reason or a geographic reason. Deaf community sign languages that you are probably familiar with are American Sign Language, British Sign Language, Italian, French, and so forth. And those are sometimes referred to as national sign languages. They're not used in one specific area, but they're more widely used throughout perhaps a whole country or um, a whole area. 
There is a blend, there is an Israeli sign language that's used in Israel by about uh, 10,000 signers. And those <coughs> people represent uh, people who have moved to Israel from many, many different countries. Sometimes they were uh, people who left Germany during the persecution or people who came into Israel from North Africa. So those different users of different sign languages came together in Israel and negotiated, and that language is a community sign language in Israel. But a village sign language is, uh, is very different. And there are very interesting differences. It often has to do with the size of the using, users of the community. There, there are between 200 and 300,000 ASL users in the United States and Canada. But a village sign language is used by a very uh, small number of individuals, and I think uh, you may have heard about the Martha's Vineyard Sign Language community. How many people lived there? Does anybody know? I guess for you. Um, 30 or 35 people, they're a very small number. Most of the groups that are listed here in the village sign languages are very small numbers, except for Isaid, where there are between 125 and 150 users. But it's still a small it is still a, considered a very small community because the users are small. So people have studied French, uh, Italian, German, Portuguese, uh, English, of course, which are considered the world languages, and they have been extensively studied. But it's interesting now because anthropologists and linguists are now turning their attention to some of the much more uh, sparsely used languages in the world. And some of the languages that are being studied have as few as a few hundred users. So instead of seeing those as not having much to teach us, Research is now directing itself to seeing what we can learn from those languages used by a very small number of users. So in this area in Israel, there were perhaps between 125 and 150 deaf individuals, but the other users of the language, family members and community members, brought the number up to 550 to 700. It's interesting that today people are finding more of these village sign languages, uh, one in Thailand, one in Bali, in Mexico. So in different parts of the world, the people are discovering these village sign languages and there's a good body of them now to be studying together. These languages were not introduced from the outside. They were not taught to the users. They are languages that emerge, and they are languages that are created in a relatively short time by the users of the language. So here is the one that I am going to talk about tonight, and which we refer to as ABSL. It's Isaid Bedouin Sign Language. Everyone in the village has the same last name, Isaid. So they have, you know, they may be uh, Mohammed or Fatima, but they all have the last name of Saeed. So they really are a very large extended family, um, all coming from the same ancestors. So the picture I showed you in the beginning is of the village, which was first settled about 200 years ago. They were nomadic. They had come from Egypt, 
where there was some discord, they decided, the one man who decided to come, it wasn't certainly called Israel at that time, but he came from Egypt with his wife. <coughs> About four generations ago, four deaf children were born in the village, and they were all brothers. So that the initial settler was a carrier, and was a carrier of genetic deafness, which appeared several generations for um, the vibrancy of their family, the intermarriage caused the, the birth of more and more deaf people. So people were marrying uh, perhaps first and second cousins, which is not a custom that we're uh, used to seeing here in the United States, but in some cultures, especially in the Middle East, both Jews and Arabs uh, feel that it's okay for cousins to intermarry. And if two cousins happen to be carriers and have the gene, then they would produce deaf children. So there could also be people who had the recessive gene who were not deaf, but who were carriers, and then they would be, in fact, um, parents of deaf children. In the village today, many deaf uh, individuals in this village marry hearing individuals, and and have deaf and hearing children, and most of them are very skilled signers. Oh, I should also mention that Bedouins, not just in this area, but all over, <coughs> believe in having large families, so we saw many women with 12 to 15 children. So if in fact I would have a deaf child, that child would have, I have many, many siblings, and the chances of one or two others of those siblings being deaf would be very high and all of the family would sign. So there was just a wonderful communication and signing everywhere, which was wonderful to see. And they had no stigma attached. Signing was very natural for everybody. And even in the schools, all the children in the classroom would sign with each other and people would rather stay in their village where everybody was very motivated to communicate with them and where uh, there was full access and they were in classrooms with their siblings and their large uh, family rather than having them be leaving the village to go to a deaf school where they didn't know other people. Many of the, of the individuals in the village were not well educated. They were uh, sheep herders and stayed close to the land. So one of the uh, byproducts of that was because people did not leave the community, then they did not learn Israeli sign language, so the integrity of their own language was more intact. This is a photo of my group, research group. We've been going to the village twice a year for the last 10 years. So I've been, I guess, about 20 times over the last 10 years. Over time, it, it was really a very interesting laboratory for me to watch the language emerge and grow. It, was, it has been a fascinating experience. Four of us are linguists. And we have had different areas of research in the past, studying different uh, sign languages and spoken languages. But when we had the opportunity to go to Israel, we have learned things that have really affected our conceptions of language and what we've studied in the past. I've learned things that I didn't know about ASL. I mean, I grew up in a deaf family. I've been working professionally for 30 years in ASL. But my work in this Bedouin village has taught me some things that I didn't know throughout my whole life. It's given me a new way to look at it and a new understanding and really has shaken my foundations in many ways. I don't 
don't speak Hebrew and I don't speak Arabic, but I do sign ASL and I'm learning to sign ABSL. We have another researcher who is, speaks Arabic. We represent many different skills that we bring together in our project. And it has been a wonderful working collaboration for 10 years. This is what the village looks like. Again, it's in southern Israel. You can't really see it in the picture, but there's another village that's uh, far off in the distance. You can see grazing sheep, goats. The children are often taking care of the animals. Uh, they milk the herd. The wool is important for them. It's a source of sustenance for the village. And this is uh, something that they have carried forward into the present day through for many, many years. People have, uh, you might think this is a primitive area, that the roads are not paved and so forth, but I don't want you to get the wrong idea. These individuals have automobiles, they have all kinds of modern technology. They have TVs, they have laptops. They have cell phones with video. So it's an interesting combination of both traditional and modern. When I actually started going there, they already had the capability to use their phones for video conversation and before I did. So they actually be, may be more modern than I am. It depends on how you look at it. At the same time, they're a culture that strongly believes in the separation of men and women. And so when I think of some of the beliefs and customs they have, at the same time as I watch the kids seeing, looking at a cartoon show or sitting on the floor and eating, I, I find myself saying, what, what is this culture? You know, how modern are they? It's an interesting blend culturally and in terms of technology. This is a photo of the school and a photo of the classroom. This classroom teacher signs, so there are deaf children in the classroom. And I wouldn't call this mainstreaming because they're in a classroom with brothers and sisters and cousins and everyone signs. This is a very different kind of, it's not a school for the deaf, but it's not a mainstream environment. Um, it's just, I'm not going to talk about this this evening, but I think it's a very fascinating way that the education happens here. This was in the New Scientist magazine, uh, giving an idea of some worldwide research that's going on on emerging sign languages. We spoke briefly about Martha's Vineyard. <coughs> Unfortunately, the Martha's Vineyard signing community emerged, but then because of disuse and other factors, the language is no longer in use and it's difficult for us to really know what it looks like. We don't have a way to access that. And it wasn't, people didn't think about uh, ways to document it. We didn't have video capabilities at that time. So that language has been lost to us and we have no record of it. In Ghana, there's another village where emerging sign language is being studied. And in Bali, and in Thailand, and where I have been working in Isaid, where we we're studying ABSL. I'm sure you're curious about what this language looks like. As I mentioned before, there were four deaf brothers who were born 75 years ago, and unfortunately, all four of them are deceased. But this woman in the video is the widow of one of those brothers. And I went to visit with her, and I'm going to show you a video. In the beginning of the vi video, she's speaking Arabic. And she's calling people to bring tea and for us as the visitors and guests. 
then you will see that she starts to speak with some co-gestures, but then she stops speaking and shifts to ABSL. And she was in the first generation of, of users of ABSL. So I want you to watch this, and I'm going to ask you for some of your impressions after you see the clip. When I first met her, I, I met her several times, but the first time I met her, the first or second third question she asked me was, how many children do you have? And I said, I have one. And she said, one? What's wrong with you? So I said to her, you know, that I've been sick. And other women said, oh, right, sick. And then she immediately said, what do you mean sick? Tell me more about it. And I said, oh, you know, I was nauseous. And she said, so what? You're nauseous, you get up, you just do the work, you do whatever you do. You have to, you know, you have to cut down the wheat, you have to make the butter, you have to do everything. You know, so she gave me what for when I told her I only had one child. She couldn't believe it. So, you know, I had to just, right, you know, you're right, I had to agree with her. She was wonderful. So, anyway, back to the signing. What did you notice? Can anybody share with us? Just come forward, please, or show me again. So, right, you saw that sign many times, and this for hospital, and the other side for tent, and this sign for building. Did you notice anything about the rhythm? <coughs> I don't know, maybe her hands were going out? Did you think it was big? Yeah, exactly. She was signing, using a lot of space when she was signing. Yes, very large signing space. And there was repetition. Right. So large, and then you could watch and recognize the different, certainly it helps with captioning. I know it's hard to separate that, but you could see the different parts and what she was saying. Um, anything else? Did you see anything in it with her expression? Hmm. Well, it, it, I think that her facial expressions matched her message. Her emotions, correct, right? It wasn't, I don't think it was uh, grammatical, what we saw, but more uh, in concert with her emotions. The more about her effect. Good, thank you. show you is of a second and third generation users having a, a signers having a conversation. Now I will show it to you at normal speed and then I will show it to you the second time that slowed down. So the one on uh, as you look on the left is the second generation and the one on the right is the third generation and is the youngest child of the second generation. So this time it'll be a slowed speed so that you can actually look at the components with the captioning. What did you notice about the second and third generation users? Were they faster and much more fluent? The signing space was smaller and a lot more grammar. But the older woman in the first generation was more like a gesturing system with some sentence-like structures, but in this next clip, it was much more rapid, and I slowed it down so that you could actually see. In, in, in normal speed, it's quite difficult to understand. And again, they have had no outside influence. This is a language that has emerged in this community of users. And the differences that we can see between the first and second generation user and second and third are really significant. And it's becoming more gr grammatical as it emerges. And I realized from watching this and studying this language that there are features of ASL that I had not understood until I studied this language. As, as I said, the grammar emerged more in the second generation and, and more, is more expanded in the third generation. And it's looking more and look other world sign languages. And we see that these kinds of changes can happen in as little as 50 or 75 years. <clears throat> so when we think about the
the speed of expression, grammatical features, uh, the sentence and prosody. It's very interesting to look at how quickly this has developed in this particular village. So it doesn't take 300 or 200 years. A language can emerge this way and become uh, sophisticated in as little as 30 or 40 or 50 years. So it, as was mentioned by the person from the audience, uh, I don't think we saw full sentences, but a lot of repetition. And perhaps the repetitions were necessary for clarification purposes. And some of them, it's somewhere between a gesture and a formal sign. And we thought uh, what the hospital building might be look like. It, it could also mean I'm in the hospital. It could be the noun for the hospital. It could be I'm going to the hospital. So that sign could be used for several different ideas in the first generation. But in the second and third generation of APSL users, the sentences are longer. We have uh, compounds. This, the rhythm is different. You know, she said, I asked my husband, can I go? And then, you know, the, the next part was the body shift and moving. Very, very clear. And very rhythmic. And, 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 and prosodic and looking like ASL sign, signed utterances. In the third generation, I don't have time to show you. I have some teenagers. And, you know, they sign, you know, it's speed of lightning, really. They're just fast. As you, you know, you have to look, just catch whatever you can. But it's very, very fluent. And with lots of words and word categories. So how grammar develops within this community, I've done some studying and realized that ASL had this same feature that I had never been aware of in my 30 years of work. So I need some volunteers. Kevin, would you mind coming up? You teach ASL, correct? Deaf studies. Okay, well maybe you have to bring call your students here. I can't see anybody's face from up here. Okay, well, I called you up. If you want, you can call some of your students now. This is what I want you to do. We have some pictures of objects and things. What do they all have in common? They are things that you can hold in your hands. And they're not big things like you know, a house or a hospital. These are things that you can actually hold on to. Would you mind signing for us a saw, the first thing? Okay, thank you. And the second? Toothbrush. Okay. And the third? Mascara. Oh. I don't know how to do women's things. I don't use it. Lipstick. And nail polish. Okay, great. Next category. Hat. Shoes. Pants. Fork. Knife. Spoon. Okay, notice anything about this, about most of the signs. I mean, I didn't notice it until I started studying ABSL. Does anybody have any observations? Repetition, okay, that's not what I'm looking for. Don't feel bad, I told you. Um, this wasn't anything that I understood until quite recently. If you look again, let's look again. How about fork? Knife, spoon, his hands show the object. Fork, knife, and spoon. But some of his, some of the signs show how it is held, like lipstick or hammer. <coughs> Handsaw. So these, they show how they are held. And some show, most of them show what the thing looks like itself. 
How about screwdriver? What is that? See that sign? It shows the thing. Hammer. How it's held. ASL likes to show the thing, but not all sign languages do the same. Thank you for being my demonstrator, Kevin. I appreciate it. I had two volunteers. Thank you for our first volunteer also. So there are two ways to make nouns. So perhaps it could be this for handsaw to show the action. But in my family, we, had it, we signed it this way. So there are two ways to sign toothbrush. Whether they be utensils, the hand either represents how the artifact is handled or the salient visual properties of the object itself. So often uh, we see the differences in different sign languages. Some prefer to show how it's held and, if the, and the sign is made in a smaller, shorter version. And I'll give you some examples. This is ABSL, and you tell me which type this is. So she was talking to her spirit sister as she was being filmed. They're giving also the number, because there's only a picture of one screwdriver. What's your sign for poem, Kevin? Okay, which is the same sign that I use. Now watch this. She uses this hand shape. Sometimes they use the open fingers. And that's the number three at the end. Three fingers up, meaning three combs. So they have different hand shapes. <coughs> okay, so that's let's move to a different sign language, New Zealand sign language. Now let's watch carefully. Now, comb is actually different. Yeah. One person does use the comb and handshake. So I realized then that there are preferences among different sign languages. And ABSL is more similar to ASL. And our language is 200 years old. ASL and ABSL is only 75 years old. And they have already established this pattern. There they are in their rural lifestyle. I mean, taking care of their herds and their animals. They're not sitting in groups discussing what's lingu linguistically correct or what's the preferred usage. It emerges in a pattern in a very short time and becomes standardized usage. We have many, many examples that we have studied of the grammar of ABSL that demonstrate these same kinds of principles. As I said, ASL likes to use these signs for knife, fork, and spoon. And in New Zealand, they prefer to use the sign that shows the way that the implement is held versus what it looks like. Uh, certainly, 
I didn't know, and, and though I've been signing my whole life, I never actually had the idea that this was part of my own language, and that there was a pattern. I mean, certainly we think of things as WH questions and other relative clauses, and we've been studying many, many different parts of the language, but I had never thought of starting this part of grammar and didn't know that it was part of our own language. And there is no equivalent in spoken language because it's particular to how things are actually held and what they look like inside. Another important point of interest is if I sign comb one way or the other, people will understand what I mean. But what is the cause for the preference for either uh, the way the object is held or the way that it looks. And, you know, perhaps you know, Kevin said, I don't know, maybe uh, it's the way people use mascara, mascara, use the sign for mascara, and that becomes what? <coughs> but, but Kevin doesn't use mascara, and he knew what the sign was, so it's not from a question of usage. But again, it doesn't matter whether it is signed as the way that it's held or the way that it looks, people still understand the concept. So this has been very fascinating to us. So from gesture, we see gestures move in as little or as few as 20 years or 30 or 40 years to becoming a complex language. And we have been studying to see which of the parts of language emerge more quickly than others. And we expect to see these same concepts and these same um, occurrences happening across many <coughs> sound languages. Um, so for us, it's important to understand that language doesn't appear fully formed like magic. This is something that begins and changes in a dynamic way, and those changes come about because of the pressures of the users to communicate clearly. They want to communicate, and they want to understand what others are saying. They want to relate to each other, and these changes happen much more quickly than we expected. So people who do not have a voice to use and do not rely on that use the tools that they do have. And they, they use their body, they can sign screwdriver, hammer, mascara, shoes, hats. People are creative, and the system emerges. This does not come from any pressure outside of community of users. It comes from the motivation of these people to communicate with each other and to be social. The language develops much more quickly, as I said, than we thought. And as we see in this group, people in the community all learn sign language and are able to communicate. As different languages are being studied all over the world, we're seeing this is happening on all continents, that people, and wherever there are community of users, the language emerges. And unfortunately, some of them, as we said about Martha's Vineyard, Within is a very small number of users that if that language is not kept alive, then um, it disappears. But we certainly know that in our community of ASL, because of the large number of users, and schools for the deaf, and sign language classes, um, our language is treated like flowers in a hothouse. We want to be careful um, to, that we keep it going and make sure that it flourishes. One important thing that I learned about studying this new sign language over the last 10 years, you know, people are not saying, oh, I can't communicate, I don't have a sign for that. People just communicate because they have a strong human need to communicate. They just move forward, they're creative, they find a way to express what they need to express. And language allows people to connect to one another. I call this unique situation in this village, a perfect storm. The factors came together in such a way that this intermarriage, these large families, the isolated community, 
created an environment in which the language could grow and develop, and the people who are not deaf were completely involved in the, the use of this language and the development. The close family relationships meant that people did not leave the village, they stayed there for 200 years. And, you know, they may be there for another 200 years, except now the young deaf students in town are going, leaving the village. They're going um, into school and learning Israeli Sign Language. Now, what will this do to uh, their own native language? You know, they're, but when, it's interesting because when they go to school and go to the school for the deaf and learn Israeli Sign Language, they come back to the village and realize that, no, they can't communicate with anybody. So they have to go back to ABSL. So one of the things I see is that the hearing people in this village are actually keeping the sign language alive versus the deaf people, which is quite the reverse of what we usually think of. So again, this is uh, a very characteristic home, one of many, and this village is characteristic of many in the world where People are finding ways to communicate where they are creating language and where language is growing. I think uh, now we should put the lights up so we can see each other and I'd like to open it up to questions and answers. Thank you very much for being an attentive audience. So, if you have a question, I think it would be easier for you to stand, and Kerry is going to copy the question for the rest of the audience, and we'll be sure we have interpretation so everybody has access to the questions and answers. Any questions? Do I see any hands? I actually can't see. I'm waiting for the lights to come up. Uh, I think ABSL is quite healthy and robust. You know, some of the young people are interested in learning and using Israeli sign language so that they can communicate with people outside the village. Uh, and, but in fact, you know, you can't criticize them for wanting to make their own language choices, as we all do. People want to learn English in the world at large because it's uh, a language that allows them to travel and communicate with many more people. So we can't be critical of a decision like that. So we're trying very hard, you know, not to be uh, disruptive of this community and their language uses and their language choices. Many of them actually um, believe that hearing people won't be able to learn Israeli Sign Language. So we are video, making video records of their language and that will be a decision that they will use themselves make themselves on how, what they want to do with those videos. And the question is, you know, will, will the language continue and survive beyond three or four generations? Uh, I, think so, I think someone told me that they were the seventh generation. So uh, it's interesting of ASL, so we don't know how long the language will continue. Other questions? In looking at the videos you have of ABSL, I didn't see any finger spelling, or I saw some numbers, but no actual letters. Is that right? So why do you think there would be no finger spelling? Well, people uh, have not been literate in a written language until fairly recently. So they don't actually have a lot of um, contact with it. Many sign languages have no finger spelling worldwide, and a small village sign language is not apt to have any written, any finger spelling, excuse me, if those people have not had educations outside the village. And if there is no national language developed with any uh, agreements and, and conventions at all. There won't be any borrowing from the spoken language the way that languages develop nat naturally. But numbers are certainly very important, and you saw in the examples on the videotape um, when they were counting the number of combs. It's a different system than we use in ASL, but it's very important for them in their daily life. 
and it's also different than Israeli sign language. I also saw, um, I, I don't know Hebrew, people thought maybe I knew Hebrew and I don't, and I had to let them know often that I didn't understand Hebrew. So it was more easy for me to um, see them use APSL. And some of them were trying to fingerspell to me and I couldn't understand them. Now, the community of ABSL signers themselves, they're not exposed to other sign languages, so how do you prevent using your own American sign language or your own sign language when you're in that community so that they're not contaminated? Very, very good question. Very good question. There are two ways that uh, we are trying to be very conscious we don't live with them. We come for very short times and gesture and try not to actually sign formal ASL. We try and adopt some signs from them. They've noticed, um, you know, things like give from ASL or move. They don't tend to use that in any directional signs. Everything is pretty linear. linear. So I have to remember not to use directional signs and to try and mimic the way that they use signs. And signing space is also very different. Uh, did you see how small the signing space was that they often tend to sign just right in front of, under their chin and in front of their chest? So we don't really spend a lot of time with them because we do not want to uh, contaminate them. So the visits are brief and we leave. It's a very small community, and when we're there, we tend to, um, to attract a lot of attention because we're outsiders. But they're also very curious because they know we're deaf, and then they want to ask us a lot of, they know I'm deaf, and they want to ask me a lot of questions about coming from the United States. I think it was a year ago when I was there, someone asked me um, about something about America, about Bin Laden and, and what happened, and whether Americans were happy about that because they had seen something on television. And I said they may have seen that, but that's really not what's happening. So they do know what's going on in the world. They have uh, animated conversations they want to know. And they're curious people. There are many things that they want to know about. And they ask me a lot of questions about um, Americans, and we have many, many interesting interchanges. Um, it's hard for me not to use my own native language, but I work as hard as I can to be conscious of not doing that. And you know, our relationships over time with people have really warmed up. But we're certainly not going to be in that community, living there, thinking that we're doing anything to quote unquote help them. We want to respect who they are and the integrity of what they have. You know, they were in fact really uh, surprised and puzzled about why we would want to co come and study them. I mean, to them, the language they use is something like breathing air. They thought perhaps we wanted them to learn Israeli sign language, and we said no, that we were really interested in their own, the language that they use. And they didn't even know that the language they used was different than the language of sign language that other people used. I mean, they didn't have that kind of self-consciousness. So it's very different to see the similarities and the differences. Oh, one of the other things that's really interesting is um, with the way that women in, are treated in the culture. You know, women cannot be in a place without their brother or their husband or another male. And, you know, they can't travel alone, so they were quite, they, was, they were surprised at me, you know, as a woman with only one child and a woman who was traveling on her own, which is something that they would never do. Another question. I'm just wondering about your travel arrangements and how you actually got there. Are there any limitations in your ability to be there that also then limits the research that you're able to do? I'm just wondering if, if you've had any uh, limitations on the work that you've wanted to do. I get, um, I had a lot of questions in the beginning when I was first there but I didn't feel like I could ask them. I think we could ask about certain safe 
subjects. I certainly didn't ask any personal questions when I first met people. We didn't know each other. I wanted to move slowly and cautiously. But still, some things about their culture uh, that are not clear to me uh, at this point. I think you have to live the life for a long time to understand that. I think we uh, let them know when we're coming. We want to be very careful about the fact that we don't just show up unexpected. We avoid going at Ramadan. We want to respect uh, their holidays and uh, their fasting and observances of their holy days. We don't go um, when we know that they're um, certainly at Ramadan is a month long. So we plan our trips to either arrive before or after Ramadan is over. So we want to make sure that the trips are planned at the right time. And we try not to uh, be like tourists, you know, coming in all wide-eyed and, you know, I think that people often come and, you know, say things like, this is so beautiful and shocking and different. I mean, we just want to respect them for who they are. You know, and there's also been a lot of um, self-reflection on our part, you know, for me to say, oh, are we doing the right thing? Uh, you know, is our approach right here? You know, have we interfered with them more than is good f for who they are? You know, as some, and sometimes uh, people from outside villages have come into that village and married, but mainly it's a very close community. It's very insulated. Women are veiled at all the time. I don't have to be veiled, but um, I have to make sure that my arms are covered and my, and my knees are covered, and I certainly wear clothes that's modest, clothes that are modest. I mean, my, it's okay if my forearms and hands are uncovered, but for those women, they must wear long sleeves. And certainly, you would never have uh, your um, shoulders bared. There's also particular clothes that you have to wear um, in particular settings that are appropriate for women. And certainly I don't have to adopt all of their uh, cultures. I, I don't count. I mean, I'm an outsider. They, I mean, they watch TV. They know that everybody in the world doesn't look like them. You know, they, they have technology. To, but they're not behind. Let's not think of that. They're very knowledgeable people. They're worldly. But they choose to live the way they do in their close community with their families. That's their value in their culture. Other questions? In looking at the different generational uses of ABSL, I did see that science shape is different. I also noticed that things were kind of marked. Like even in the hand shape, sometimes there was it was some uh, limiting use. Is that what you what what's found typically in emerging languages, Lynette? I wanted to ask you something else. Don't leave. <laughs> You're right, that the hand shapes tend to be uh, less marked. Uh, we have uh, counted hand shapes with a different sign on. I think we counted five different hand shapes. What you noticed about the sign for comb, can you, do you remember what that was? Does anybody remember what the sign for comb was? This or this. So there were three different hand shapes signs for, and in, in a small sign language, why do they have three different, I mean, we have one sign comb. Does anybody have another sign besides that one? Anyone else know another sign for comb? Basically those two. I don't think we ever use some of the ones we saw them using. Uh, the sign for cat, they have several signs for cat. Wide variety and many different, same movement, different hand shapes. So it's interesting to me that in this small sign language, they have a, a more variation than we do in a, in a larger language. Do you know why? So why might there be just one sign for comb or one sign for cat in ASL? Why do we not have to, why don't we have three or four? We have 200,000 signers in our community of ASL users. Why is there no more variation? And with six or seven hundred users, they have four variations with the same sign. Why do you think that is?
Is there more similar gestures? Uh, well, I, I guess I mean that when, when the the that there are um, individuals will use a sign and say, "This is how I express comb," or "This is how I express cat," and then someone else will have a different way of expressing it. So there's more variation among the users. Yes, that's true. You know, when in a small community, you know everybody's signing. But in a larger community of users, I mean, we've never met before. So we have fewer signs, fewer variation, because we have to understand each other, having never met. So we will use the same sign. The larger the community of users is, the language becomes uh, actually more simplified and more standardized. But in a smaller community of users, it's more complex and more variation. So we might say, I walk, you walk, we use the same word on she walks, they walk. We, we have one verb form for all of those um, different persons and number. So that's a, more, that's a more simplified form. And there are billions of speakers of English. So as the language is used by a wider community, it becomes more simplified because we all must need to understand each other. But in a small community of users, people tend to know each other in a very small group as in this village and they can understand each other no matter what sign they use. <coughs> so it's interesting, this is something we've learned from studying this small community of language users, that this is a reason for the variation. Let me just clarify that. So if, with the handshapes, is it a smaller number of handshapes or is it that the signs themselves, there are two, two or three signs for it? What do you mean? In the first and second generation, There's more flexibility. So you can see comb can be signed with two fingers or three fingers. So we sign egg using two fingers in each hand. We would never think of using signing egg with four fingers. But in fact, you know, there's more permission for variation. And there's less permission in a larger community of users. Again, if I were to meet someone on the street that I've never met before and we want to communicate, we need to have a shared understanding of meaning and fewer choices. Is there a difference in gender was a question. Well, as we saw Kevin doing signs for um, mascara and lipstick, it's interesting in um, ABSL they use just one finger to sign lipstick and they use one finger to sign uh, nail polish. They have, uh, as I said before, several different signs for cat. many different signs. So the man will know what the woman's signs are, so, so I don't think it's really uh, gender specific. The understanding crosses gender. And this is, again, I say, not because anybody from outside standardized this or told people this is how you have to sign it. It's what's emerged from the use of the language. I think we have time for one more question. Is there anyone else who has a question? Multilingualism is very common amongst uh, users of spoken language and this is a really interesting opportunity to study multilingualism among users of the sign language. I, I wanted to hear a little bit about how common multilingualism among sign language users is and then what you've learned about sign language multilingualism from studying these people. The young people are bilingual in ABSL and Israeli Sign Language. And they're very, very different, distinct languages. And they can easily navigate between the two. Uh, more than two, they have to be exposed to another sign language. And in the region, uh, it's very strict in Israel. People are not allowed to move, uh, given what's been going on in the Middle East. Uh, and the reason people actually do not have the freedom 
able to travel and move in that way. So they tend to stay uh, in those small communities. I mean, there may be other parts of the world where the people are multilingual users of sign languages. Um, one thing that's interesting to mention is about multilingualism. Uh, you know, as I said, the young people are using Israeli sign language um, more and more. So we decided to videotape them using Israeli sign language and show that to Jewish deaf people to see whether they could understand them. And they uh, could to some extent, but they didn't sign exactly the same way. And then I realized that these were Arabs, and so they weren't going to actually sign in a way that looked like um, Jewish, signing, Jewish signers. It's almost like, you might say, a different accent. They had a different accent that marked them as Bedouin Arabs, even though they were using Israeli sign language. So that was very interesting to me. So it isn't just that people uh, take on a language. When they start to use it, they modify it to reflect who they are. We now know how to describe sign, uh, accents in sign language, which we didn't know how to do 30 or 40 years ago, but we are becoming skilled as we study languages around the world and we can recognize those accents. The Bedouins, when they sign, tend to have a very, very small signing space and there's a kind of a fluidity to the way that they sign. Uh, it's in Israeli sign language as opposed to other Israeli sign language users. So the prosody is different. And it's very marked. So even though they are learning this language from outside their community, they, uh, they use it in, and are in a different way. So it's also an, an issue about um, identity. People are Bedouin, they're deaf, they're Muslim. So depending on, you know, and as we know in the Middle East, it's very complicated um, and very, very diverse groups of people. And this is just one small group of, Arab, of uh, Bedouins in one part of Israel. Now, I don't know if there are any announcements. Matthew, do you have anything that you need to say or do as we... Uh, is the reception set up? And do people know where that is? I guess I'll follow the crowd. Again, thank you all. Um, and we can, I'll take more questions when I see you in the reception room.